Monday. I just want to make sure everybody is um, going to be. Is, will everybody be here for Monday for the library uh, orientation? I think um, Connor is the only one who is planning on not being here. Okay. Um, military commitments, and I am collecting field trip permission slips right now. I have the um, transportation set up, and I've been in contact with Andrea, who I have a. Great. Great. Yeah, she's going to be doing the presentation on Monday, so she'll be explaining to you guys you know, how to access information, databases, and those kind of things. She also has, um, because you do have Damon accounts, she can actually show you how to sign in to the library with your Damon account, so it's not as um, complicated as, as we thought it might be. So uh, Monday, we'll just understand you're going to be spending just some time trying to figure out um, how to use a college library. That's um, that's what we'll be doing. So, um, Ms. Worrell, I don't. What what time is your expected arrival on Monday? Just so um, we know. I have arranged for bag lunches for the cafeteria staff so they can eat in the bus on the way here, and then hopefully we'll uh, you know get there around one. Okay, perfect. All right, I, I'll make it a point of being there at one o'clock then. Okay, great. All right, well, now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about um, Young Goodman Brown. And I just want to start out with 
this introductory part of the story because uh, as you know this introductory part I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it up on the uh, computer so that everybody can just kind of follow along and I'm just gonna I, I'm going to you know to highlight some things on here that I think and I don't have the high I don't have the ability to highlight it because of the um, the, the nature of the document is a PDF but Here's this introductory section. You know, here's you know, young Goodman Brown came forth at sunset, and of course, sunset is going to be an important time, right? The, the the timing of this, the positioning of this story in a certain place, right? I mean, it's Salem, right? We know that historically Salem was associated with the witch trials, right? Uh, put his head back after crossing the threshold to to exchange a parting kiss with his young wife. And Faith, right? And there it is, ding, 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 ding. He's telling you that Faith is named Faith. And he says, as the wife was aptly named. So we need to know that Hawthorne is kind of hitting us over the head with the fact that she's named Faith for a reason. You know, thrust her pretty head into the street, letting the wind play with the pink ribbons of her cap, right? She called the Goodman Brown. And then she's telling him, she's like, you know, put up your journey until sunrise, sleep in your own bed tonight. A lone woman is troubled. She's afeard sometimes, right? And she says, pray, tarry with me this night, dear husband, of all nights of the year. And obviously, she's trying to keep him at home because she doesn't want him to see her being baptized into this devil ceremony, right? So Goodman Brown, though, look what he says. My love and my faith. In other words, he's talking to her about my woman and my religious faith. He said, of all nights of the year, this one night I must tarry away from thee my journey must be done between now and sunrise. So he, this is one of the key factors about understanding the story, Young Goodman Brown, is that he isn't being exposed to sin because of accident. He is choosing to go into the forest to take on and meet sin and meet the devil head on. He knows he's going to come across something out there in the middle of the night. He just probably doesn't know what, what it is. And then Looks into this. So I just got them telling you when I was reading that first paragraph, right? The the pink ribbons of her cap. Now look at this. You know, then God bless you, said Faith, with the pink ribbons, and may we find you well when you come back. And then he said, you know, say your prayers. We know no harm's gonna come to me. And then he looked back as he's leaving town and saw her peeping after him in spite of her pink ribbons. What on earth? Is going on with the pink ribbons. Whenever you see something repeated in fiction, you should recognize the, you know, the importance of it. Hawthorne is doing something with the pink ribbons. Can you, for any reason, explain to me what you think the pink ribbons are about? What would have? All right, go ahead. I think the pink ribbons, like when they're stated repeatedly, it's a way to tell readers, like, this is important. So, anytime you see the pink ribbons, you're going to think of faith. So, yep. if later on in the story, you'll see that it states, like, something of pink ribbons, you're automatically knowing it's not faith. And that's what, and that's what Brown sees at the end, right? Is that the pink ribbons are, are in, the, um, in the forest, and he finds the pink ribbons there. And so, that's what, again, so yes. That, on a literal level, would mean keep an eye out for the pink ribbons because it's going to show up later in the story. So, on a figurative level, do you want to keep going? Yeah. Um, pink ribbons you also hear about with little girls. Ooh. Little girls also are like innocent. So, I think the ribbons might represent innocence. Is she innocent, though? Miss O'Brien. See, I also want to like add on to that and like point out a question. Um, he marries Faith. Does that make him like Faith? because he marries her? Well, I, <laughs> if you think about this, this is the major question of the story, right? Because one of the things you're going to ask, if, right, if you're going to try to figure out who's the better person here, who's the more faithful person in this story, you know, is it Brown or is it Faith? I mean, one of the things that I find problematic about Brown is the next paragraph, right, where he says, you know, she's a blessed angel on earth, and after this one night, in other words, I'm going to go out into the forest, and I'm going to meet the devil tonight. I'm going to experience sin. And then he says, after this one night, I'm going to cling to her skirts and follow her to heaven. In other words, it's like, I'm not going to make my own decision to be faithful. I'm going to associate myself with this, you know, pure, innocent, little childlike creature, right, that I've married, and I'm going to follow 
her to heaven. She's the one who's going to direct me to heaven. Do you get that sense? Right. I mean, she one of the things that Goodman Brown should be trying to do here. And what I, I think is is, you know, is is incredibly problematic about him is that he he should be his own person. And it seems to me that he is basing his faith on his marriage to his wife. And that could be a major problem with determining whether he is a, a person who is, you know, sinful or sinless by the end of the story, right? Because once he goes out into the into the forest and finds everybody else in the town out there, you know, meeting up with the devil and essentially, you know, in communion with the devil, right? He comes back and his reaction is negative. He thinks everybody's a hypocrite. So the, the question becomes, is he a hypocrite? So if you start with these first few paragraphs, and this is what really a, what a master of storytelling Hawthorne is and what you should be doing. Like we, we kind of saw this with other authors, and this is something that Hawthorne really does well. In the beginnings of his stories, he sets up some very specific um, you know, lead-ins. He sets up all the other images that are going to be coming out in the story you know, in his first couple of paragraphs. So, I mean, one of the things that I, I find really interesting about this is that, all right, so he starts out here in Salem, and he's in this, you know, bright place with his wife, and she's leaving at, sun, at sunset. But then once he gets into the forest, right, look what happens, right? He's on a present evil purpose. And look at the road that he's on. It's a dreary road, darkened by the gloomiest of trees. They barely stood aside to let a narrow path creep through, and they closed immediately behind him. It was as lonely as can be, right? You get the sense that he is stepping into a place where he is really uncertain, where he is scared, where he should be because he's meeting, you know, he's meeting Satan. And obviously what happens here, right, is he goes into the forest, and he does meet Satan, and he finds this out. But before we get into the meeting with Satan, I just want to back up for a second. I want to show you this document that I kind of produced for you today. Because this is going to help you understand really what Hawthorne is setting up for us. So uh, can you see the screen? Vic? Can you see the document up there? All right. If you think about this story from this perspective, then this might help you kind of articulate what, what Hawthorne is trying to do. You can take young Goodman Brown's name and you can kind of divide it up, right? I mean, if you split it right down the middle, you've got young and good on one side and you've got man and brown on the other side. So this is really kind of important because when you start to think of associations with young and good, you start thinking about things that are innocent, virtuous, pure, right? You start thinking that, you know, that young Goodman Brown is a pure person. But on the other side of the equation, right, is that he's a man, right? And we all know that, you know, if from the Puritan's perspective, right, man was fallen, right? Adam and, you know, it, it, Adam ate the apple. And because Adam ate the apple, man was sinful, right? Man was condemned to sin, and man needed to be redeemed. So from that perspective, right, the fact that he is a man makes him sinful, right? The fact that he is, you know, he he's not he's not pure, he's not he he's not sinless, right? Makes him more associated with earthly, which really connects with the with the word brown. And brown, as you should know, is a fairly common name. And so what I think Hawthorne is doing is he's setting up here that this dichotomy, right? Dichotomy, D-I-C-H-O-T-O-M-Y, dichotomy. A dichotomy means that there are kind of polar opposites. There's two sides. And that's what he's, he's doing. He's setting up this dichotomous structure with the name and with the association of what those, what those um, associations of those ideas with his name mean. So... In Brownists, by the way, the Puritans were led by a religious leader who was, his last name was Brown. And so a lot of the Puritans were called Brownists. So the fact that his name is Young Goodman Brown is, is not surprising that he uses Brown. But essentially what he does is he's setting this up, right? You got the young and the good on one side, the innocence, the virtuousness, the pureness, and then the simple earthly commonness of his other side of his name. He Goodman obviously is a you know is, is a kind of a reference to like a title. It's like calling somebody Mister. But in this sense, right, we can divide this up, and we it, because we know Hawthorne is dealing with this dichotomy, right? We know that there's Salem on one side and the forest on the other. And when you think about Salem, the parts of the story that take place in Salem, it's daylight, right? The streets are open. It's a visible community, 
there, right? But when he gets into the forest, the paths become dark and shadowy, right? Everything becomes uncertain. He sees the, you know, the staff of the man who he meets on the path, who's obviously the devil, and his, his staff seems to wiggle like a serpent, right? He calls it an ocular deception. He's got all these things that he sees out there, but he's not even certain that he sees them, right? He finds all of his religious leaders out there in the woods, and he's not even you know, sure what they're doing out there. So in the forest, things are just uncertain. Things look, you know, are, are confusing to him. And this is essentially the, the purpose that Hawthorne is trying to create. See, because in the village, right, every, all these people have their religious jobs, but when they're in the forest, they're meeting with the devil. So let's take this dichotomy and associate it with faith's pink ribbons, right? So here's faith. He even says, my love and my faith. So on one side, she's his love, right? So she's his earthly association. But on the other side is that she's his faith, his religious faith. So she, Hawthorne even tells you her name has dual purpose. But more than that, the pink ribbons, right? You already hit on the fact that those things associate with this whole left side of the, of the chart. Innocence, virtuousness, purity, those things that all represent like a little girl, right? But pink, you should know, is really just a combination between red and white. So now when we start to think about red and white, we start thinking about the dichotomous structure that Hawthorne is setting up, right? On the white side, again, is the pureness, the pure, you know, the, the sinlessness. But on the other side, the red side, that's the deception, the lustful part of being a man, being a human, when I say man, just about being a human, right? So here's the sinful side of man over here. So Faith's pink ribbons should be really a sign that she is a sinful creature too. Even though she's Faith, she still has her faults. And this is, I think, what Hawthorne is trying to set up through the devil's sermon, right? So when the devil meets these, you know, these people in the forest for this, this ceremony, I mean, his whole argument here, and this is what's so great. And I just, I want you to get down to the, to that section. I'm going to, um, I want you to, to go down there with me to this at the end of the story. So this would be, um, the paragraph that's after it starts, you know, bring forth the converts. I don't know if you're, if you're there, right. But so at page 14, I think I skipped something. All right, so at page, I think that's, yeah, page 14, you see this paragraph right here that begins with there, resume the sable form, right? So here's this, the, the devil starts his sermon, right? And he says, you know, welcome my children to the communion of your race. And this, is the message that he's going to deliver, right? In the communion of your race, it means like he's bringing together all people on the same level. We're all going to operate at the same level. And the devil tells him that, you know, look, you can pretend you're pure, but you're not. Because you are born on this earth, you are not sinless. You are a sinful person. So he says, hey, all of you who think you're holier than others, right? And if, you, and if you shrank from your own sin, contrasting it with the righteousness of the prayers of, of the people around you, if you think you're sinful because you're looking around thinking everybody around you is sinless, then he's here to tell you, look, I'm going to tell you their secret deeds. And then he goes on and explains how the elders of the church whispered wanton words to young maids of their household, how when many a woman eager for widow's weeds, you know what that means, right, trying to inherit their husband's property. Right, give him a drink at bedtime and let him sleep his last sleep. In other words, they poison their husbands in order to get what they, you know, to get the, his his wealth. And how fair damsels, blush not, sweet ones, have dug little graves in the garden and bidden me, the sole guest, to an infant's funeral. And he's talking about abortion, right? So you're you're seeing all of these sins that are being, you know, committed here by the people of the of the community, right? And he's and he's telling you, he's like, look. He goes, whether this happens in the church, in the bedchamber, in the street, in the forest, where it doesn't, doesn't matter, he goes, the whole earth is one stain of guilt, 
one mighty blood spot. And this is key phrasing that you need to keep a hold of as you're evaluating this because this is the point that seems to escape young Goodman Brown, right? The devil's making the sermon. The whole earth is guilty. Everybody sins. Everybody commits crimes. Everybody, no one is perfect. That's what he seems to, you know, to be saying here, right? He calls this the impulse, the impulses of human power, right? That, you know, look everybody at each other this is this is who you are and then you know he talks about bringing forth the converts and all that kind of stuff and, and that kind of stuff and then coming forth is is goodman brown's wife faith and so he yells out faith look up to heaven and resist the wicked one and then he doesn't know if she re if she resists him or not and here the last bit of this paragraph right whether faith obeyed he knew not he hadn't spoken to himself. He listened to the roar of the wind. He staggered against the rock. He felt chill and damp. And he had been, it was been on fire. It was with dew. And then the next morning he wakes up. So right there, right? The story, if we're just concerned that Goodman Brown, you know, is is concerned about everybody else's sin, the story would end there. But it doesn't. It continues on because now Goodman Brown comes back to the village in the morning. And now he's got to face all the people in the village that he saw out there in the forest cavorting with the devil. So this is the key part of the story, right? Because normally we would just say, hey, he could have just dreamed it. Or he could have just felt that, you know, the, the, uh, the event was his imagination. But instead, he comes around bewildered, right? He's walking along the graveyard. He's listening to the old minister meditating the sermon. He's bestowing a blessing on Brown as he passed. And look what he said. He shrank from the saint as if to avoid him, right? I mean, he is a, he's like, can't even be near this guy because he's a hypocrite. And then old Deacon Gookin was at domestic worship, right? And he said, what God doth the wizard pray to, right? And he's challenging this guy's faith. And Goody Cloyce, the woman who taught him his catechism, right? Yeah, you know, had a little girl that she's talking to right there, and Goodman Brown runs up and snatches the child away from her. And then here comes Faith with her pink ribbons, right? Which is Hawthorne bringing back the image again, bursting into joy, skipping through the street, and almost kissed her husband before the whole village, which would have probably been, you know, a public display of affection that was probably not really welcomed in that Puritan community. And Goodman Brown passed on without a greeting. He just walks right by his wife. So here is the question, right? He dies a stern, sad, darkly meditative, distrustful, desperate man, all because of this one night. He was miserable. And when he dies, right, they talk to here when he goes to his grave. Followed by all of his children and grandchildren, they carved no hopeful verse on his tombstone for his dying hour was gloom. So Goodman Brown dies a miserable man. Why? Because he can't tolerate the fact that other people are sinful? Let's go back to our diagram, right? So here's everybody else straddling the two worlds, right? Faith, the person who's probably the most associated with goodness right even faith is straddling the two worlds she's white she's red that's what makes the pink ribbons she's good but yet she's evil she's sinful but yet she's sinless right she's she's supposed to be the virtuous wife in the village but she's the one being baptized into evil in the forest right everybody seems to straddle the two worlds even goodman brown by virtue of his name should be straddling the two worlds, right? The world of goodness and evil. But what Goodman Brown fails to do here is admit his own sin, right? He doesn't see himself as being sinful. Go ahead, William. Oh, it's Andrew. Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't see. It's Andrew, sorry. I think that, that Goodman Brown, he's like in denial. He, he feels like he's only being like part of the good side. He doesn't feel like that. he's um. He's any red. He he doesn't feel like he's straddling anything. He, he sees he everybody is like kind of like um is bad now. So like um, 
So okay, that's so that's a really good point to make. So let's th let's talk about that for a second. So if that's the way he's operated, if he thinks everybody else is bad, and he thinks that he's good, right? Is that the greater problem? In other words, does does he by him thinking that he's better than everybody else, right? Is he failing to admit his own sinful nature, right? Is he failing to recognize that? Hey, he's a man just like everybody else. Does he think that he's better than everybody else out there in the world? Does he think that he's pure? Does he think that he is without sin? Go ahead, Cameron. I couldn't hear only but about two words. That's the sin in and of itself because he's being prideful. There you go, the sin of pride, right? So that was, and, and that's what some theologians would say would be the greatest sin of all. But, okay, Miss O'Brien, you want to defend him? Um, no, I don't necessarily want to defend him. I just wanted to point out, like, in the beginning of the story, uh, when he first meets the devil and stuff, uh, the devil kind of says, like, um, I've met your grandfather. Oh, and yeah. And yeah. your father, and I met you. And so, if, why, why would he, like, he thinks so highly of his grandfather and father, and he can't possibly come to terms that his grandfather and father met with the devil and conspired with the devil. So he must think that he's better than him and or his father and his grandfather and people before him because he's not consorting with the devil. Per se. Yeah, you need to you need to highlight that point of the story, right? And that's um, page seven. So um, we'll get to that in a second. Go ahead, Andrew. Um. So I think that the author is kind of like playing with our like views of like to the devil and Satan. Like I feel like most people feel like the devil and Satan is like this horrible evil person that like or thing that you can't like even like think about or talk about. But like in the story, the devil seems more like he's more like he he, he says things as it is like he's saying like like everyone sins sins and like. And no one's perfect, and everyone sins. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 go ahead. Yes, no, what? Uh, what? Talk, talk about story. Yeah, I mean, I think the devil. I mean, what what Hawthorne is trying to do here is to just say that you know that that Satan can intervene in our lives and you know a variety of forms, right? And that here he he comes across as almost being like a preacher. Right where he's giving the sermon, telling the people that you know, look, don't be ashamed of your sin, embrace it, right? And I think that's what the villagers, the people in the village, including Faith, are doing. Right? They're out there in the forest. They're admitting their sin. They're taking part in this sinful activity. But then once they admit their sin, they're able to deal with it. Right? Brown fails to admit his sin, and I think that's what Cameron was saying is that that's his sinful nature, the pride the pride part where he thinks he's above everybody else. O'Brien brings up the point, right, where I'm on page six. Let me just show you this little part in here so everybody can get, um, oh no, what did I just do? Where on page six, I want you to see this part right here, right? He walks into the forest, right, and he's looking around and here's this, he comes across this figure sitting in the, in the woods, and the guy says, you are late, Goodman Brown, right? Like, like he's been expecting him, right? The, so here's the devil just like, you know, he's just one of his friends, somebody that's sitting out there in the forest. And Brown's, his, his reply is operating on several different levels here, right, where he says, Faith kept me back a while, meaning that, well, faith kept me from getting into the forest on time, but also that faith, his religious faith, would not allow him to meet with the devil, right? That's what he's trying to, he's, that's, that's his problem. So, you know, and, and he also, I think you should know this, right? He, he takes a look at Goodman Brown, he starts describing him, and he says he bears a considerable resemblance to him. In other words, the devil looks like him. And there's other issues in here too, right? So he talks about the, the, the staff wriggling like a serpent. You know it's the devil. When Goody Cloyce runs into him, right, she turns and she says, ah, the devil, right? So she knows that you know, she's out there and what she's doing. The deacon and all the other people are out there with the purpose of meeting with the devil. That's what they want to do. But here is the issue, right? When he says, you know, 
Goodman Brown, right? Let's let's keep walking. Let's keep walking. We've got you know places to go. And Goodman Brown says, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa! Slow down there, Satan!" And he goes, "My father never never went into the woods on such an errand, nor his father before him. We have been a race of honest men and good Christians since the days of the martyrs. And I shall be the first of the name of Brown that ever took this hat, right? So here, I mean, is he naive? Maybe. Is he innocent? Maybe. Is he sinless? Uh, I don't think so. Let's take a look at what, what, what the devil says to that. The, look at the devil's reaction. He's like, well said, Goodman Brown. He goes, I've been as well acquainted with your family as with anybody among the Puritans. And he goes, and that's no trifle to say. He goes, I helped your grandfather when he lashed a Quaker woman. He said, I brought the, uh, the, your father a pitch pine knot, and we set fire to an Indian village. Right? I mean, look what the devil's telling him here. He's like, I have been a part of your family for generations. All right, let's go back to um, uh, Andrew. Go ahead, Andrew. Like, um, the part right there, like, I noticed, like, I, like, the, like, that's where you see kind of, like, government brows in denial. Like, those events that he just described that his um, grandfather did and his father, but, like, that's, like, sin. But, like, government brown doesn't admit it that, like, like all right, so, so you guys, I get it. You right now, all of you are on the you're taking the position that Goodman Brown is probably the worst person out of this. He's the he's the most problematic, right? He's probably the one that carries the most sin because he doesn't recognize it himself. He's not self aware. He and the grandmother are the same, right? If you want to look at it that way, the grandmother she just didn't recognize her, her own evilness. Brown doesn't recognize his. Cameron. I was going to say that um, it might not be entirely Goodman Brown's fault because it's, it might not be entirely Goodman Brown's fault because this has saying like our ideas of good and evil have a lot to do with the historical concepts of the time. That's so, true. Whereas they, they might have seen themselves doing a good thing like burning down the Indian village when reality is still murdered because back then they didn't see Indians as like people. Right. Well, the, you're, you're right on with that, but let me also say this, right? Is it possible then that by his upbringing and that by his commitment to his faith, right, that he's trying to avoid evil? And this is, I mean, is he to be faulted? Does it make him a worse person if he's trying to be pure? That's the question, right? When Brown comes home, and he sees the people around him who've all been in the witch ceremony, right, and been playing the major roles in the in the witch ceremony, right? He can't bear to even look them in the eye. He just wants to run away from them. He's miserable. He's his whole, I guess, identity with other people in the community is shattered because they are now hypocrites in his eyes, right? Hawthorne seems to be turning this around from your perspective. What you're saying. And say, really, the hypocrite here is Brown. He's the one who should recognize his own sinful nature. But what has he done that has caused him to be sinful other than he went out into the forest, he faced the devil, and he tried to resist, right? I mean, here's the argument, guys. I mean, you can take a look at this and his behavior, and you can say, all right, sure, he isn't self-aware. He is, he is kind of naive to think that he, you can be this. But at the same time, He's trying to be, I would think, a defender of his faith and his and what he was taught. He seems to be, you know, a person of blind faith, if you want. I mean, he he doesn't challenge what he was taught. Everybody else seems to challenge it. Everybody else seems to accept the guilt and accept the sin. Brown's like, I don't want to be sinful. I don't. I don't. If I can avoid it, why can't I? So why does that make him bad? Go ahead, Stephanie. Yes, was supposedly doing this and he was undevotedly um undeniably devoted to his faith then why would he marry faith and be married into his faith and cling on to her skirts because he knew he wasn't going to happen that's right and that's the thing you can use for the counterattack, right that's exactly what you do you go when you when you're faced with that and this is what you have to do right when you're arguing about these characters you have to be able to find out, hey, where's the strength in their argument? Where's the weakness in their argument? And, if, and you can say that Brown is trying to be a virtuous person. He's trying to resist sin and temptation. But at the end of the day, he admits it. It's almost like 
I'm not a faithful person, but I'm going to marry this woman and follow her to heaven. And hopefully by marriage, that will get me into heaven. And, you know, and this was actually a, an argument. So, you know, historically what was going on here, um, that in the Puritan faith, one of the things that they constantly talked about was this, you know, this concept of election. In other words, the Calvinists believed that God kind of looked down at certain people on this earth and chose them to go to heaven. So that if you were chosen, if you were part of the elected, then you couldn't resist that. You would just naturally be a good person and you would do good things and God would reward you, right? That's kind of what this election thing is all about. But what happened was that the Puritan church dissolved after you know less than 100 years in, in this country because nobody knew who was elected. So those people who were good were sinful and they had to admit their sin. And so they would look around, they're were, they were saying, well, it's certainly not me because I'm a sinful person. I can't be elected. So then the church started to die, right? The church started to shrink. And so what happened is that the governing board and the body of the church started to say, well, if you're married to someone who everybody thinks is elected, then you can come into the church too, right? Or if you're the sons and daughters of, of someone who we think is elected, then you can come into the church too. Because at, cer at certain points in time, they were just kicking people out of the church, right? If you committed a sin, you weren't part of the church anymore. And they just excommunicated you from Massachusetts Bay Colony or Village of Salem or whatever. So if, if you have this really restricted criteria for what it means to be part of the church, if no one can meet the criteria, eventually you're not going to have any members in your church anymore. So here's what Hawthorne seems to be saying is that, you know, Brown is making this, this argument that I'm going to be faithful because I'm married into it. And historically, that you can understand where that's coming from. But it's still, I think, I mean, do you understand the argument here? From the perspective of the villagers, right, you're looking at them like faith and you're saying, okay, they're virtuous people. They're committed to their religion. They go out into the forest. They meet with the devil once a week, and they have this little party, and they come back, and they continue on with their lives. In other words, they just get it out of their system. And some people are going to look at that and say, that's hypocrisy. Other people are going to look at that and say, hey, that's what it means to be human. We're not perfect. We can't be perfect. But on Brown's side, you're going to say, Brown's trying to be perfect. So in his attempt to be perfect, does that make him sinful? because he's trying to do something that man just cannot do? Or is that a characteristic that makes him a virtuous man, that makes him closer to his faith because he's trying to be good? Go ahead, Andrew. Well, like, in Christianity, with um, confession is like where you admit your sins, and then you get uh, forgiven for them. Like, I feel like that's kind of what the bills be for the devils. They're like accepting their sins or and they're like washing them away so that in the morning and back in the in Salem they can uh, continue on. Yeah, so you know, they're, they're, you make a very good point there, and I want to bring this up, but here's the, here's the problem with that, right? Is admitting your sin by communing with the devil <laughs> a good way to, you know, wash yourself clean of your sins? I think that's where the, the troublesome part comes here, right? Is that it's not necessarily communion, or it's not really a, a sense of confession where you're saying, okay, I'm a guilty person and, you know, forgive me. This is like, hey, I'm going to go out and hang out with the devil tonight. And then I'm going to come back tomorrow morning and, you know, declare myself, you know, sin free. So I get exactly what you're saying. I just think that they're taking it to an extreme and which makes their argument not so airtight. Go ahead, Cameron. Uh, I what Andy said. Maybe um it could be a way of them like avoiding the sin of pride that Ben Brown has by humbling themselves and accepting the fact that they can be sin to you. That's a, that's an excellent point. Yep. So they're humbling themselves, they're admitting their sin, that's a way that they're going to do it. All I'm saying is that hey, there are other ways to humble yourself, there's other ways to admit your sin. And you can you can see, I hope you can see that there's two different ways of viewing these characters. If you want to hold Faith up as an example of the villagers, great, go ahead and do it. You, she's a perfect example of someone who is faithful, but yet 
faithless because of her connection with the devil and her baptism into that uh, in that ceremony. And Brown, you can look at him as that, yeah, he's prideful, but is he trying to do the right thing? Right? And he's just trying to stay the course. He's trying to do what he was taught to do, which is, hey, don't go out and commit sin. It's interesting that he chooses to do it, right? He even tells Faith, I've got to go out into the forest and face the devil tonight. And if it wasn't for his faith, right, he wouldn't be able, he would be out there communing with the devil too. He would just get in line with everybody else and he would be part of it. But no, he resists. He tells her, resist the wicked one. He doesn't join the crowd, right? So in a way, you got to find him to be good in some regard here because he's trying to resist that temptation. He's trying to resist that sin. Yes, he may be prideful. He may be foolish to think that he can. But at the same time, he's trying. So I, I, I'm with you guys. I, I understand exactly where you're coming from, why you're thinking Brown is, is the bad guy here. It's the same argument we have with the grandmother and the misfit, right? I mean, the grandmother is like Brown. She doesn't recognize her own sinful nature. And she's got to be shown. And that's what Faith does with young Goodman Brown. But on the other side, you've got someone like Faith who's out there saying, you know, hey, uh, I'm sinful and I need to just admit my sin and just, you know, do my part. And that's kind of like the misfit, right? Because the misfit just comes out and says, hey, I don't want any help. I don't want anybody to pray for me. I don't want to change because I know who I am. Go ahead, Cameron. Uh, another buddy. Uh, like, like two things, actually. Um, the word doubt shows up a lot in the story. Say that so word again. Word doubt is repeated a lot in that title, so I was wondering if it was like said to say that perhaps Spillman Mount Brown is just dreaming. That that's been a constant uh, issue throughout this. Except the problem is that I don't think it matters. I think what matters is how Brown responds to the event, whether it's a dream or not. I think it's how he responds, right? And that was my point before. If it was just a dream, the story would have ended when he wakes up. But he comes back to the village and he lives this now. He's, he doubts everything. He doubts every person, right? And, it, and sure, it, it, it might have been a dream. It might have been real. We don't know. It really doesn't matter because he's affected by it. Okay, Andrew. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Cameron. You had, you had one more thing to say. Also, uh, how Andrew said that it seems like the devil isn't really that bad in this story. I was wondering if maybe, like, um, Alfred is trying to portray the devil as, like, the human, like the embodiment, the embodiment of sure. the human condition. Yeah, yeah, it's not a guy with horns and a tail and that kind of stuff, right? I mean, it's just the, the devil is is a is like a tempter, right? That that the devil can appear in a variety of different forms. Um, you know, I mean that there there's all sorts of of interesting literature out there that you know deals with good and evil, and you know the, the pictures of devils are are you know usually not you know, monsters, but simply just people who tempt, you know, tempt man to do evil things. All right, one last comment, Andrew, and then we're going to wrap it up. Um, I think that the author, um, I think she, that she purposely chose Faith to be the one that was being communed with the devil, because I feel like this story would be different if it was just any other person. Yeah. I feel like he wouldn't care as much, but because it was Faith, that like, that like yes, it, it's and he tells us right at the beginning of the story as the wife ap was aptly named, right? He wants us to know that faith, right? In order to have faith, you probably have to, you know, be like this faith, which is to admit your guilt, admit your sin, admit your, you know, your weaknesses. And I think this, you know, is, is the commentary that a lot of people want to, you know, want to apply here. But I, I also have to tell you, you, know, you can look at this in different ways, right? So there's not one clear interpretation. As you read in the article that I gave you, right, there's different ways that people are going to respond to this, right? So, all right, so for Monday, we're going to get together. We're going to talk about the library stuff. If you've got any more questions, we can, we can talk about those um, on Monday. If you've got questions and you want to start throwing this stuff out over the weekend, feel free to shoot me an email over the weekend. Um, I'd be happy to talk to you about this over, you know, email. Um, but it, at the, the next stage is to really try to start putting the paper together. As you know, we've got drafts due next week, and we're going to try and get this paper written and pulled together by next Friday. So um, 
I'll come to class with you on Wednesday of next week so we can kind of, you know, hash out the, the drafts and make sure that you've got a good argument and a good presentation of ideas. So you're going to be using the text, obviously, to make your argument, but you should also be looking at that article to help you make your argument as well and bringing that into the conversation, okay? Questions, comments, concerns? Winfield, I still don't have your paper. I don't know why. Yeah, I work with Ms. Warrow to resend that paper to me, okay? All right, questions, comments, anything else to say or do? We'll see you on Monday. Looking forward to it. All right, see you guys.